Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Began. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Health with the Massachusetts Division of Insurance. Uh, we have scheduled today's webinar to um, improve information available regarding coverage for up to 12 months of prescription contraceptive contraceptives within the state of Massachusetts. We are coordinating this in conjunction with the Mass Hospital Association and also with the Mass Medical Society. Um, we hope today to go through a short presentation, but to leave room at the end of the presentation uh, for questions. We are recording today's session because we intend to make this information available on the Division of Insurance uh, um, Access website, and also we'll make it available to other parties. Our intent today is to improve awareness of the 12 month prescription contraceptive mandate and use this to help collect information that we'll put together for um, question and answers as we go forward. If we could begin on the next page. Massachusetts has a law passed in 2017 referred to as the access laws. Under this law, insurance carriers within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts are required to cover federally approved contraceptive drugs, devices, and other products as listed in the Federal Birth Control Guide. It's noted within the presentation where anyone can go to that on the federal website. The mandate includes, but is not limited to oral contraceptives, patches, and vaginal rings. It, ex it excludes male condoms or FDA approved oral contraceptive drugs that do not have a therapeutic equivalent. The law does require that carriers cover voluntary female sterilization procedures and FDA approved emergency contraception available over the counter, whether with prescription or dispensed by a licensed pharmacist consistent with the requirement of Mass General Law Chapter 94C, Section 19A. The next page. According to the law, insurance carriers must cover at least one drug one device or other product in a contraceptive method without any deductible, copayment, or coinsurance being applied. This means that insurance carriers may provide coverage for more than one type of drug, device, or other product, but they're not required to cover every such therapeutic equivalent version as long as they do cover one product that is going to be covered in each method without any cost sharing. For all other drug devices or other products in a contraceptive method available without cost sharing, the insurers may apply deductibles, coinsurance, or copayments that apply to other covered drugs. Insurance carriers shall also cover patient education and counseling on contraception and follow-up services, including, but not limited to, management of side effects, counseling for continued adherence, and device insertion and removal. On the next page, we'd like to highlight what it appears that there has been some confusion within our state, that contraceptives are available for up to a 12 month period. Insurance carriers are required to cover prescription contraception for up to a three month period, the first time a prescription contraceptive is dispensed to a member and following the initial dispense up to a 12 month period for any subsequent dispensing of the same prescription, which may be dispensed all at once or over the course of the 12 month period, regardless of whether the member was enrolled in the plan at the time the prescription was first dispensed. We at the Division of Insurance have forwarded bulletins to the insurance carriers they have forwarded material to their network providers, pharmacy benefit managers, and network pharmacies, and all should be clear about this feature of the law. After the initial three-month prescription, then covered members may receive up to a 12-month supply of a prescription contraceptive. Insurance carriers shall not impose unreasonable restrictions or delays in the coverage in accordance with the requirements of chapter 176.0, the managed care law. On the next page, insurance carriers may apply what are called utilization review techniques 
but they must conform with all the requirements of our managed care law, including that medical necessity guidelines and processes are standardized and established by planned medical directors with input for local medical professions. The determination that a carrier makes about a certain type of request is to be made within a 48 hour period of the request. And if an insurance carrier denies a request, which is referred to as an adverse determination, the insurance carrier must offer the covered person the right to an expedited appeal process and to appeal the denial with the insurance carrier and through an external appeal coordinated by the Mass Office of Patient Protection. The carrier must also have an exceptions process to waive the applicable cost sharing for any individual for whom the carrier's designated form of contraception would be deemed medically inappropriate by the individual's provider. Next page. The key is that is if an individual's attending provider recommends a particular FDA approved contraceptive based on a medical determination with respect to that person, regardless of whether the contraceptive has a therapeutic equivalent, the carrier shall provide coverage without cost sharing subject to that plan's utilization management procedures for the prescribed contraceptive drug, device, or product. We want these to be as clear as we can be. We understand that there have been instances where individuals may have found that it's not clear that there is access to 12 months of prescription contraceptive coverage. It is something that we need to make sure that it is cleared not only to consumers, but also to providers and also to pharmacies. And we are likewise pursuing ways to make sure this is clear to all parties. On the next slides, I do wanna just clarify one thing that is really the division of insurance's role and which insurance companies are subject to the law. The division of insurance's role on the next page as a regulator is to set parameters for health insurance carriers to follow when they offer insured health plans, such as HMOs or PPOs to Massachusetts individuals and employers. DOI is responsible to enforce Massachusetts health insurance and managed cares laws, and apl which applies to Massachusetts issued insured health benefit plans that cover individuals and employers. My name is Kevin Began. I am the Deputy Commissioner for the Healthcare Access Bureau, and I've made sure to put my email in this slide deck so it's available for all providers and consumers to be aware how to get in touch with me if they're aware that there is anyone who is not complying with the law. One thing on the next page we have promoted is that insurance carriers are required to make individuals aware of their rights. We do spend time with the insurance carriers to make sure that they update all of their evidence of coverage material to make sure it's clear about what is allowed under all of the state mandated benefit laws. This page is from the Mass Association of Health Plans providing what are called fast facts of what is available for insurance coverage within the state. And I'd highlight the third box, which talks about how any individual can get a 12 month supply. Health plans in Massachusetts governed by the law are required to offer coverage for a 12 month supply of prescription contraceptives. The first time a prescription contraceptive is dispensed, your plan will cover a three month supply any subsequent dispensing may be up to 12 months for a total of 12 months in any plan benefit year. They advise and we advise that all consumers talk to providers about whether a 12 month supply is right for the individual. I will highlight on the next page, one part that unfortunately is confusing. The division of insurance regulates insured health plans, which are issued within Massachusetts. The Division of Insurance does not regulate government programs. We do not regulate Medicare or Medicaid. We do not regulate insured plans which are issued in other states, 
sometimes referred to as out-of-state health plans. Many Massachusetts residents work for an employer that is headquartered elsewhere and offers employee benefits through its headquarters, whether it be in New York, Minnesota, California. Those health plans are not subject to Massachusetts laws. They're instead subject to the state law where the coverage was issued. The Division of Insurance also does not regulate what are called self-funded employment-based health plans. Many or most large employers self-fund their benefits to employees rather than buying insured plans from insurance carriers. These are sometimes referred to as exempt ERISA plans because federal law makes these insurance or these health plans not subject to state insurance laws. I highlight that because as noted on the next page, there's a slide that indicates what health coverage was in the Commonwealth. And you'll notice from the green and orange slices of the pie, employer and non-group or individual represents about 70% of the coverage in Massachusetts. And then Medicaid, Medicare, other public and uninsured represents the remainder. Next slide indicates that even for those who do get employer coverage, which is sometimes referred to as commercially insured coverage, if it's fully funded or fully insured, the Division of Insurance regulates that coverage. It means that the insurance company is taking a premium for the employer. And for that reason, it then is fully insured and subject to all Massachusetts laws. On the self funded side, many large employers are self-funded or headquartered outside Mass, and their coverage is not regulated by the state. I highlight this because while I can easily talk about the laws that apply to insurance plans, it is something that you must be able to find out from the employee if they are covered by an out-of-state health plan, for example, a Blue Cross of California, or whether they work for a large employer because they may find that their self-funded plan does not provide access to 12 months of coverage. This doesn't mean that a majority of individuals in Massachusetts still will not have access to coverage. The next slide. When accessing 12 months prescriptions, it is important for providers and consumers to know that this may be a right available to them. Well, we are trying to look at ways to have more information available that could help providers and consumers be better aware of whether they are in an insured plan or self-funded plan. It is still important to make consumers aware that they may be available for this coverage. And when accessing 12 month prescriptions, it's important to be able to advise the consumers to learn how to ask questions and to talk with their provider and the pharmacist to find out whether they are eligible for the coverage because they're in an insured health plan. I think it's key, after the three month initial prescription, what should the prescription say so that the patient can receive a 12 month refill? We think it's important for the prescription to not say anything that seems to limit it to only a three month refill. It should instead point to a 12 month refill. So it's clear that the individual is being prescribed by the physician for a longer period of time than for a three month period. We still are looking through other questions though, and we will highlight within question and answer packets that we're developing with different parties, some of the other things that we're still trying to clarify, such as since certain prescriptions are for a 28 day package, how many packages should be available for fill since there are 365 or 366 days in a 12 month year. We still need to clarify that and make sure that's clear to all parties. Can a patient get both the three month initial prescription and then 12 month refill in the same plan year? The consumer in that first year can get both, but in all subsequent years, is only, there is only a 12 month refill that would be covered. And then what happens if a patient changes health plans? How does the 12 month refill work? Likewise, I think we need to develop procedures that are gonna be clear for all. If the consumer continues to go through the same pharmacist, 
even though they may change health plans, that information is stored with the pharmacist that they already had received their initial three month initial prescription and should be able to communicate that information to the insurance company. But these are the sort of operational things we need to have better clarity going forward. Today's session was intended to make clear that this 12 month coverage does exist. It is something that insurance carriers and their network pharmacies should be aware of it. And we're using this to make sure that it is clear to as many people as we possibly can. On the last slide, we wanna make sure that all who are part of this call and all that we talk to acknowledge that there is a way to complain. If any provider, any individual believes that any insurance company is violating any provision of the contraceptive mandate, they should file a complaint with the Division of Insurance. We recommend that all parties use the Division of Insurance complaint form. We think the complaint form will allow us to get standard information in completing it, we ask that anyone completing it gives us information about the insurance company to which the complaint is identified, the dates on which this occurred, and any interactions that may have occurred where it might've been on a telephone to the insurance company or any conversations held with the pharmacist. We know that this law is one that needs to be well known to all so that all consumers are aware that they have access to the mandate as prescribed within the law when they are in an insured health plan. At the same time, we acknowledge that there needs to be more work done with pharmacists and other parties to make everyone more aware of it and to develop any guidelines we think need to be set up so that it's administered in as easy a fashion as possible. I'll stop at this point. Uh, we wanted to make sure there was adequate time for questions that were raised by different parties. Um, Aaron Bonney has been helping me from the CHIA to help us identify if anyone has any questions they may want to pose. We ask that if you have an opportunity to raise your hand, we'll be able to call individuals one by one. Um, if you have problems learning where to raise the hand, Aaron, you might want to just remind everyone where it is on their, their uh, web link. Sure, so if anyone has any questions, you can find the raise hand function in either the participants or the reactions. Uh, we ask that you mute yourselves before and after asking your question. Erin, are there any questions at this time? We had one question just come through the chat, which says, after the initial three month supply has been filled, does the access law guarantee patients be dispensed 12 month supply of OCP at no cost, or may there be a cost to the patient? So if this one prescription is the one that is identified as the one for that health plan that is available without cost sharing and for the three month prescription, it is provided without cost sharing. Then the refill when provided for the 12 month period would also be available without cost sharing. If someone does change prescriptions and it is not the one identified by the carrier, that is the one that is available without cost sharing, then that may actually trigger because it is not the one that's identified without cost sharing, it may trigger new cost sharing for that individual. I think there were a couple of other questions. Yes, so we have two questions. The first one is, are the patch and ring a separate category from oral contraceptives? My understanding is that when reviewing the federal uh, list of contraceptives, they are separate categories. I think that any who wants to be clear what all the different categories are should refer to that web link that was on the first page of the presentation. Um, I'm very, I am clear that I believe those two are very separately identified, but I think with the list, it is useful to be aware of it, to identify exactly how many different categories there are. And then the second question is, 
Does the insurance protocol you mentioned include a possible prior authorization process or does coverage mean no PA? So carriers are allowed to use prior authorization. Not all will, but they are allowed to use utilization management techniques on, I believe, page five of the presentation. There were provisions that were identified about how carriers would have to follow certain utilization review techniques. If they do use them, they need to make sure any medical necessity guidelines and processes they have are standardized. They need to make sure that determinations are made within an extremely short period of time. And there have to be rules in place to make sure uh, it's the one that's labeled managed care reviews, if that helps, Aaron. There you go. Then they need to make sure that they're giving individuals the right to actually go through an exceptions process, or if it's denied, to actually then go through a right of appeal. Again, I think this all depends on the insurance companies. We know that the insurance companies have to um, make sure these rules are standard, but for many insurance companies, they don't apply prior auth for certain of these procedures or prescriptions. So it'll it depend on each of the company's sire to actually implement them. Erin? The next question that we have is, can you clarify that both patch and rings are covered under the 12 month supply provision? Um, as long as they are identified as one of the separate methods, and I'm not sure, Aaron, if there is a way that you can get on slide two to that um, web link, then it will be the one place that I think that all providers should refer to, to at least identify where all of the separate and distinct methods are clarified and identified. Um, each of those separate and distinct methods must be available according to the provisions of the access law. And there must be at least one of the different types of, of products available in a method for both no cost sharing and also to be available for both a three month and a 12 month prescription. So again, Aaron, I apologize that if, I'm not sure if you're able to link what's on that page too, but anyone who actually wants to see verification of exactly all the methods, the best place for them to look would be at that web link that's identified on page two regarding the federal birth control guide. Are you able to click on that link? Yeah, there you go. I just put it in that chat box too. I'm not sure that's coming up though, Erin, is it? It's not, nope. So it is something that I would recommend to all become familiar with that Oh, there list. it goes, Kevin, it's on now. And I apologize, I can't see it because I'm blocked. Yeah. So if you don't mind, Yael, if you could lead Erin through it, I just can't see how it actually looks. And I'll just let folks know, um, Lita Anderson um, also put it into the chat box so folks can link, click on it and have it directly on their own sites. But it says birth control and says types of medicine and devices for birth control. Um, it includes as permanent sterilization, long acting reversible contraceptives, contraceptive injection, short acting hormonal methods, barrier methods, other contraceptive, emergency contraception. Some and things the, to think uh, about. Yeah, yeah, the chart um, linked at the top there that says print the, the birth yep. control chart that yep. has um, laid out the details um, pretty easily. Yeah, the different yep. categories. Yeah. So thank you for your help on that. I think it, there you I, go. Yeah. this would probably be the easiest chart to use to make very clear what each of the categories are. And each carrier, again, must include at least one product within each category without cost sharing. And the prescriptions are available for a three month and also a 12 month period. Once someone has gone through the three months um, initial 
a prescription. So thank you for pulling that up. Erin, additional um, questions? Yeah, we have another question of, do you have suggestions on how to indicate that a particular prescription is the one to trigger the 12 month benefit? So if there is a prescription that is provided for three months, that same prescription should be available for 12 months. So it is not that a certain prescription actually qualifies for a 12 month. It's more a matter that once the individual goes through the initial three month prescription, the law allows for that individual to be able to get a 12 month prescription of that initial three month prescription. So I think it's, it's key to think of it that way. The law is not saying what triggers the 12 month. It's instead saying that once that individual goes through their initial three months, they then have the right to be able to get a 12 month prescription of that same thing which they received in the three months. Erin? The next question we have is, what's the best way to identify which agent within each category has no cost sharing? It will differ by health plan. So I think each health plan is required to make it clear within their own materials, which of the drugs or which of the method within each category they may have an identified um, prescription that is available without cost sharing. The law requires they have at least one. Um, carriers may include more than one. And I think it's very important to understand each carrier's specific way that they've identified which prescriptions will be available without cost sharing. Uh, carriers are available for consumers to contact and an individual might find it useful to contact the carrier and find out from the carrier exactly how the carrier has identified which prescriptions are available without cost sharing. Any final questions, Erin? No question, just one comment in the chat to say that the law no, not only requires each method category, but also one of each type of therapeutic equivalent for OCPs, except OCPs where there's only one available within the therapeutic category. But Thank no you. other questions in the chat, and I'm not seeing any raised hands from participants. Well, we thank you for joining us today. We acknowledge this is the beginning of what we hope to do to make sure that all the features of this law are available and, and, and are easily accessible for individuals. Um, we will have this information available on the division's um, preferred link and make sure that consumers and also providers are aware of it. We will engage providers over the next few months to try to answer some of the questions that are just not clearly articulated but I do wanna make sure that all involved are aware the division of insurance is available if there are any concerns that an insurance company or their network is not properly enforcing the law. Thank you again for the time today. I thank uh, Mass Hospital and Mass Medical for uh, co-hosting this. And I likewise thank Erin uh, Bonney from Chia for coordinating today's call. Any last comments or questions, Erin, before we leave? I'm not seeing anything. All right. Well, thank you again for your time. I hope you have a good rest of the day and please feel free to contact us if you have any concerns about how this law is implemented. Take care. I hope you have a good day. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you.